Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Norma Kosteka, publisher of the North Bay Business Journal. Before we get started this morning, I want to thank you all for being patient. We had some technical difficulties in the world of Zoom as we are as it is today. So thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for hanging with us. And without further ado, we're going to go ahead and start our event. Welcome to our annual specialty food and beverage event. Our mission of the North Bay Business Journal is quite simple. One, to give our business community accurate news and coverage of their business category. Two, to provide our business community data and reports to make knowledgeable decisions in their business category. Three, and definitely not last, to provide a forum of experts in the, businesses, in the business community to share the expertise and intel which make their businesses thrive. Today, we'll be doing all three. But first, let's thank our major sponsor for this morning's event, Carl Mackey Power and Ross LLP. We would also like to thank and recognize Naturally North Bay. Before we get started with our first speaker, just as a reminder, please get your questions ready and post them on the Q&A prompt on Zoom. We will ask our speakers the questions after the presentation. Our first, speak, our first expert today for today's event is Anu Goel. He is president of the Client Growth Solutions for the consulting firm Spins. Anu will report which natural food brands are doing very well since the pandemic began as people stock pantries, prepared for extending homestays, and look for ways to stay healthy during the entire pandemic. He will also report on how the natural foods market includes true believers and the struggling switchers. Anu has been tracking the industry for over two decades, not only in a leadership position at Spins, but previously at Brand Equity Ventures, McKinsey and & Company, and Bean. Welcome, Anu. Hi, Norma. Thank you for the kind introduction. and. Uh, for the invitation to join you all today. I'm excited to be here. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anu Goel. I'm a president at SPINS, uh, and I'm excited to share with you um, our perspectives on the state of the natural industry. I'm going to quickly just share my screen and get the presentation queued up. Um, today, what I wanted to do is, um, you know, 2020 has been a crazy year, and so when we look at the state of the industry in 2020, I'm gonna start by sharing some perspectives on what we saw through pandemic. Um, and I think that'll be an interesting way to ground everything. We're then gonna step back though, and look at the mega trend we've seen over the last 20 years uh, towards natural products and unpack some of the key drivers of what's been going on. And then I'd like to close by sharing some perspectives on what we see coming next and some of the trends that we see uh, that'll take us forward into 2021 and beyond. So that's the plan for today. Um, just to get going here, for those of you who don't know SPINS, uh, SPINS is the leading data and analytics provider for the natural products industry. We, uh, we've been around for 20 years. We've, we, we collect literally trillions of rows of data and we're unique in being able to capture data for both the natural retailers, the regional grocery retailers, as well as the traditional conventional retailers. And our focus and mission is helping use that data to provide a common language for natural and specialty brands in the marketplace and retailers, and a dialogue between them and all the supporting cast members that help those brands succeed. That's what our focus is. As Norma mentioned, I lead up a division here at SPINS. Um, my focus is really helping brands and retailers use the data effectively to enable growth, enable growth strategies that involve growing distribution, driving velocity up at shelf, and innovating new items that are relevant for the marketplace. I also work with our investor community quite closely. We have some unique applications for private equity firms, for investment banks, for uh, consulting firms. So those are the couple areas that I lead here at SPINS. All right, let's dive into some of the, the information today. At the highest level, when we look at 2020, it was an unusual year. You know, the total industry grew about 13%. And to put that in perspective, 
prior to last year, we were seeing roughly around two and a half percent growth rate, you know, reflecting population growth dynamics. Now, one of the things spins can do and only spins can do is we can unpack this total growth rate into a few different product segments. We call those the conventional position products. You see some of the brands there. And you can see collectively, they grew about 12% last year. So a little less than the overall industry. But they're huge brands, huge part of the market, and 12% growth is phenomenal for that set of, for that set of products. We further segment um, the growth into two other segments. We call those natural products and specialty products. And as you can see here, those segments outpaced conventional products by about 4% last year, 4 to 5%. So everything went up quite a bit, but those product segments continue to outperform. And it just shows you that those are really important to, to consumers. All right, let's talk about uh, COVID a bit more. Uh, obviously a very, very strange year. We're gonna talk a little bit about those three product segments and what, what we saw happen last year. So what this graph shows is the annual growth rate of those three product segments. Natural products is the green line, specialty products is the yellow line, and then conventional products is the blue line. So as you look through all of 2019, you can see that um, specialty products were outperforming conventional products by about 2%. Natural products were outperforming conventional products by about 4%. So we know that dynamic has been going on for a long time. Then COVID hit and, and you see the spike in March and literally every product segment just started to um, explode. And so we saw a sharp rise in all the products. When you fast forward to the end of the year and we're looking at now pretty much all year 2020 growth right there, what's interesting is that that 4% advantage for, for natural products has been basically sustained throughout all of the COVID period. Especially products have started to gain an advantage through COVID. You know, it used to be about 2%, but their advantage is now more on that 4% range as well. And that's largely driven by um, a focus a bit on indulgence and, and beer, wine, and spirits. Uh, that's what's kind of unpacking and driving some of that additional advantage there. But really, really fascinating to see what's happened through COVID. And when we kind of dig in further, we really see three phases of what, what we experienced during COVID and what, what consumers were buying. Phase one was this last spring, you know, we had this initial reaction and in pantry loading. You could see sharp rises in protective products, staples, frozen foods, all the things that you'd expect, including, you know, larger format multi-packs. Then, you know, summer hit and people started to figure out this new quote normal and you know people were working from home and so we saw one of the things that struck us was that prior to covid we'd seen this big trend towards on-the-go snacking but that wasn't happening as much in the summer and fall you know people just weren't on the go they were staying, they were working from home staying at home the baking craze of course we saw and then the sustained increase in household cleaning products you know everything else kind of that that kept going and then come winter, a new dynamic emerged, which is that, you know, a lot of people hit some hard times in the end of last year. And so we had this, this confluence or combination of people being focused on wellness and personal wellness through COVID, but a lot, also we had recession happening and we had people, a lot of people struggling. So we saw a shift towards healthier foods at a value and more proactive health prevention products. So that gives you a good snapshot, high level snapshot of the phases of behavior we saw through the data during, during pandemic. Stepping back now, like we look back 10, 20 years prior to COVID, you know, there's been this mega trend uh, towards natural products. We all kind of know that and have seen that through the data. So I wanna talk a little bit about what's been driving that. There's really three factors that we see driving that mega trend. The first is this, this change in the consumer and what they're seeking from products. We call that the demand side of the equation 
and that's completely shifted. And we call that, that, that trend the conscious consumer trend. On the flip side, on the supply side, we see this, all these products coming out that are, that are trying to adapt to meet the needs of this new conscious consumer. So there's a big supply shift happening. And then in between that is retailers connecting the dots, connecting brands to shoppers, and we call that the route to market shift. So I wanna dive into each of these now. In terms of the natural consumer, what we've observed through our data for the last 20 years is a mega trend towards conscious consumption. And what we mean by that is that people are literally making more conscientious choices, more informed choices about what they, what they buy. You know, and, and we see this mega trend towards what we call good food and good products, better few products. And we, we've, we've discovered that it's really got four types of um, dimensions. One is, you know, good for your own personal health. A second is good for planet. A third is good for animals. And the fourth is good for other people like fair trade products. So these are the various factors that are driving this mega trend towards natural products, specialty products, and, and good food and better for you products. But not everybody's the same. You know, every, every shopper is a little different. Some, some care more about, are making conscientious choices based on what they, based on the environment they care about and the, and the planet. Some, some shoppers, you know, they, they, make, they really are driven to natural and healthier products through their kids. Once they have kids, we notice that they're starting to behave differently. Some folks are much more realistic about it. They say, yeah, you know, I want to be healthy, but it's got to fit in my lifestyle. And then some people just, they're not going to adapt to, to natural products. They, they're happy with the products that they've been buying for ages. And so what we've learned at SPINS is there's really seven segments in the market based on their attitudes and interest and purchase behavior towards natural products. On the one end of the spectrum, we have these, what we call true believers. On the other end of the spectrum, we have what we call resistant non-believers. And then five segments in between. And what you're seeing here is that the numbers for true believers is they're about 10% of the population, but about 25% of purchases in natural products. So if you want, if you're a natural brand, it's really important you understand this shopper and are communicating with that shopper. Same thing with enlightened environmentalists. They over-index a little bit on their um, focus on good for planet products. Healthy realists are a really interesting segment because they, um, they often start into natural products through their kids. And strap seekers are folks who are very interested in better for you and good for you products, but I just don't have um, the ability to afford it as much as they'd like. So they might be more inclined to buy it when, when there's a promotion. Um, maybe they, they buy it when they see it at Costco or Walmart, a, a store that is a little bit better value for them. So that's one of the big things we've learned, but this mega trend towards people making more conscientious choices, that's one of the key drivers of, of this industry growth. The second factor we see is, is, is the supply side, product innovation. I always think of innovation as the lifeblood of growth. And we see that in spades with, with our industry. You know, brands have continued to innovate in design products that meet the needs of these conscious consumers. It used to be about organic, but there's a lot more that's come into play in terms of what people are seeking and how brands are addressing the needs of this conscious consumer. It's very exciting. You know, we think about brands that are most successful, they really embody three characteristics. The first is they end up solving a big problem. You know, so brands that are in big categories and really disrupting those categories end up being very successful. They've found a need that a consumer has that's not being met by the category participants today. And then they don't stop there. They, they continue to innovate. They, they 
sometimes they make big pivots, but most often I find them fine tuning until they figure out exactly what that shopper wants, what the, what the right value equation is, so they can be very successful. And here's just a, here's just a sampling of brands that we think uh, meet these three characteristics. Um, lots, of, lots of success out there in our industry. So that's what's going on, on the brand side. The third piece is what's happening in that connection between supply and demand, the route to market, and the retail landscape that's just constantly evolving. This is the picture of the retail store, you know, and I think we all, we all realize that uh, there's been a fairly big trend towards the perimeter of the store. I'm going to show you some growth rates through, through COVID by department here. You know, produce continues to grow. You know, look at this, this area of refrigerated, some amazing growth segments that we see in that, in that department. Then you see in your sort of the home, personal care, body care segment, some really strong growth and a shift in retail towards better for you products. So the store is literally changing in terms of what they're carrying to meet the needs based on innovative brands and to meet the needs of these shoppers. But the biggest change we saw through COVID was really center store, you know, because whereas before we were seeing a trend towards the perimeter, fresh products, because of pandemic and the desire to stock up, people were more interested again in, you know, longer shelf life products. And so the center store saw a real resurgence both in terms of what's been at the shelf and, and the uptake by, by shoppers. And what we see in the industry is really three segments of retailers, each playing a very important role in the marketplace. On the far left, we see our natural retailers. Um, we call it the natural enhanced channel. You know, retailers like Sprouts and the Fresh Market are here. These are innovation leading retailers. They're the first ones to um, embrace new products. They're, they're really trying to help in the store with, with discovery of those new brands. They really want to be differentiated from all the other retailers. And they often focus on you know, more unique and, and sometimes exclusive items. It's a great place for brands because there's lower barriers to entry and you can get in and really hone your, uh, your, your, your growth model, your success model to scale. On the, in the middle, we have this emerging channel that we see called regional grocery. It's really kind of under the radar, but really, really important because retailers like Rouse's Market or Sendix, they're, they're, they're playing a really important role in, in their community. And so they're focused on that local market's needs, both in terms of the people and the shoppers, but as well as the brands. And, you know, they're not quite punching so heavy like Albertsons and Safeway, but a lot of people really rely on these retailers for their needs because they're really addressing that local market need. And some people think of this channel as being a bit of a bridge to mass. You know, I don't necessarily want to go you know, to all the way to Albertsons, this is really, they have an interesting mix of mainstream items, but also some really interesting local items and relevant items to that, that, that consumer, consumer in, that, in that geography. Also lower cost to entry for brands. And then on the far right, you've got what we call our conventional multi-outlet. This would be food, drug, mass, club, um, and they, they play a really important role, especially for brands around scale. You know, and, and for shoppers, it's less about discovering new things, but you know, I've got my shopping list, I wanna replenish and go back in and get my, get my stuff. You know? um, and so they tend to focus on the best sellers from the other two channels. They're not the ones who are gonna take a chance on a new product, but if it's working elsewhere, they, they might pick it up. That's how we see the retail landscape. And you know, we've seen growth across all segments towards natural and specialty products, but we see each of them playing an interesting role for shoppers in the marketplace. 
All right. Last thing I want to cover is a little bit about where we see the market going next. I always get this question of, you know, what are the trends? What are the trends? And so I wanted to take a moment to, to give you our perspective. We see really um, five trends that continue to drive uh, growth in the marketplace. And we'll, we'll dive into each of these shortly, but th these are what the five are. So starting with plant-based. I think everybody knows plant-based is a mega trend out there. Uh, you know, Beyond Meat disrupted everybody's uh, uh, way of thinking. But to put some data behind it, you know, plant-based is, is really, plant-based products are growing twice the overall average of the non-plant-based counterparts. So that's a big, big difference. The other thing, interesting thing we see about plant-based today is that you know, people think of plant-based and they say, oh yeah, you know, beef, chicken, poultry, I mean, uh, 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 um, pork, you know, those main segments, those meat segments are becoming plant-based. But what we're also seeing now is that plant-based is going mainstream. Like it's in a lot of categories where we're seeing this real shift. It's not in just traditional meat categories and see some of those listed here. And so this will continue to expand, I think, in, in the, the years to come. A uh, lot of innovation going on, especially from a taste standpoint, making this much more accessible for people. We also see consumers who are saying, you know, I'm not vegan, but I like eating more plant-based type products. You know, folks might do a, um, Meatless Monday, even though they're not, you know, full on vegetarian or vegan. Being plant based is much more approachable, acceptable, and now there are products that you can, uh, that service that need um, that tastes great. The second trend we see is what we call food as medicine. Increasingly, we're seeing people realize that food can play a meaningful role in and their personal health. It's always been the case, but now they're starting to use it almost as a role medicine plays. And so what I mean by that is we see this huge growth in products that have um, certain ingredients that you know, have a specific functional benefit that you might get from a vitamin or supplement. You know, the best example is people often, a lot of people struggle with sleep. Uh, it was true through a pandemic. And you'll see products put in, you know, melatonin or, or, or products focus on sleep that don't have melatonin, but, you know, are trying to play that same role. So we call that food as medicine trend. And, you know, we see focus on obviously through pandemic immunity boosting products. You know, you see some of the products down there that are focused on that. De-stressing. A lot of people are stressed through a through, uh, pandemic, you know, and being able to um, sleep better. So products focus on that benefit. Um, and then products with adaptogens really trying to fight um, multiple dynamics that they might be facing. Uh, and challenges they might be facing. And you see some of the products and characteristics and ingredients we see there. So this is what we mean by food is medicine. The next trend we, we talk about, we see is well, diet is lifestyle. And, you know, I think uh, probably the two most significant diets that tribes we see out there are, are, are paleo and keto. Um, I think probably everybody's heard about those. Uh, but what I think is, and you see some of the, the categories that are, you know, are being disrupted by products that are paleo on the left and products that are keto, categories being disrupted by keto products on the right. You know, there's a lot going on here. But the other um, kind of interesting thing we're seeing here is that it's not just about being paleo or keto. Um, we're hearing consumers say, hey, you know, I'm not really keto, but I'm still focused on net carbs, you know. 
so I'm watching not just the carbs, but also the fiber and, 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 and doing the, the math, right? Um, we see them focused on protein, you know, so there's a bunch of products out there that aren't just for the keto and paleo um, dieter. It's for people who are embracing these principles. These principles, I think, are going to have some longevity to them as people try the diets, might come off of it, but have learned something about what makes them feel better. And they want to keep, keep up with some of the principles. Next one is what we call fresh snacking. You know, I think uh, snacking has certainly been important through pandemic. Um, I think over the holidays we saw people say, you know what, I, I need a little bit of indulgence. <laughs> let me get some, some pies, let me get some treats for the family over the holidays. We're gonna at least do our best to, you know, celebrate and enjoy ourselves through what has been a challenging year. And so snacking continues. Um, we see it in a lot of different areas. You see some of the growth categories here. You know, people are still snacking with natural products, specialty products. They want to be healthy, but they're balancing, you know, indulgence with that healthy lifestyle. When we talk about fresh snacking, what we mean is products that are uh, less processed, um, often refrigerated. You know, for those of you who are familiar with Perfect Bar, uh, that was really a pioneer in terms of refrigerated snack bar. And after their acquisition, we saw a lot of new entrants in, in that refrigerated um, bars category. So we continue to see um, a focus on protein, you know, sort of very fun snacking. We're seeing some plant-based uh, products. But you know, as people snack, we're, we're starting to see, we continue to see this trend towards an added benefit. You know, they want their snack, they want their indulgence, but maybe let's get some more protein while we're doing it. So that's what we call fresh snacking. The last one is uh, we see a continued focus on self-care in 2021. And so just to put this in perspective, you know, these are some of the things we saw in 2020. Obviously, everybody was focused on some of the basics of wellness and prevention. And we see those vitamin and supplement categories here that were really high, high, high growth last year. And so when, you know, we, we, we think some of this will continue um, as people have built new habits. Um, I think everybody knows that categories like hand sanitizers and, and, and immunity supplements were, were really, really strong. What's interesting to us though, is that there's been a lot of innovation in these categories. You know, so it's not your standard hand sanitizer. There's more green stuff. There's more specialty stuff. And some of that may continue uh, just as a new behavior, you know? Supplements, I think people picked up uh, an awareness of what makes them feel better. And then on the other side of self-care, you've got you know, things like bath salts and fragrances and foot care, which saw interesting spikes. And I think people are just, um, for sure for 2021 and perhaps even beyond, just more uh, conscientious about how they can care for themselves more regularly. All right, so that's the fifth big trend we see going forward. And uh, yeah, that's our state of the natural industry. I would be, I uh, wanna thank Norma Yu and the entire uh, event team here uh, for letting us join and open to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anu. A great presentation you had, but naturally, naturally we have some questions for you. I have one, you, you have identified some key trends in the industry. Are these likely to change as the vaccinations against COVID bring the economy back on a more even keel? Yes, I mean, uh, I, absolutely. Obviously, you know, some of the dynamics we saw through pandemic are, are very specific to COVID, but the five that we featured today, 
we believe have longevity um, both through 2021 and beyond. These are, these are big trends that we see. The only one I would say that might dissipate more is the self-care one, but mm -hmm. even that, I think there's just a much greater, what we see here from consumers, just a much greater awareness mm -hmm. and um, interest in taking care of themselves in new and different ways. All right, second question we have. Clearly, the popularity of natural food industry is accelerating in the marketplace. Is that being driven mostly by the preferences of consumers under 30 or not? Yeah, great question. Um, every generation is becoming more conscious. Mm -hmm. So we see a shift in the behavior of um, one of the ways we are able to cut the data is rather than by those uh, seven segments is by generation. And we see every generation is shifting the mix of what they're buying more towards natural products. So it's affecting everybody. It is true that, you know, some of us who grew up like myself on conventional brands, you know, we might not be shifting as much and this next generation, young, you know, the millennials or the under thirties, they certainly haven't started with those behaviors. They started with natural products. Mm -hmm. The starting point is very different, but they're also continue to drive more interest in it. So um, it is true that they're a big driver of this. Having said that, we see every generation shifting their preferences. Thanks, Anu. Perhaps it's not surprising to hear that in the midst of this pandemic, consumers are trusted, turning to trusted brands. Now, let's turn to someone else who can provide a multi-layered look at this industry that's so important to us in the North Bay. Robert Steele is a managing director in investment banking middle market for Bank of America. As we all know, this year has been like no other, and Robert will address which companies have been swept up with this tidal wave of change and which are steeled against the storm. And he will also discuss the sustainability is changing the picture of investing in the industry. Welcome, Robert Steele. Thanks, Norma. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Sorry we can't do this in person. Uh, looking forward to when we can all get together next year. Um, but in the meantime, uh, things, at least in the investment banking world, have been extremely busy and uh, the conversation here is really to focus on what's been happening and how it impacts uh, ultimately the the specialty food business uh, going going forward um, you know in terms of the the activity this year for us it feels like q5 2020 because really last year never stopped and the pace only accelerated going into uh, going into 2021. So if we can flip, I'm not sure if someone has the ability to share screens, but if they do, we can flip to page two. If not, I'll just go ahead and talk about um, what we have in the presentation. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. So to start off, you know, rolling us back to the beginning of the year, um, in March, obviously, we had a major uh, stock market, equity market, financial market cataclysm with, uh, with the onset of COVID. And we entered into a bear market for the first time in, uh, in over 20 years, uh, about 30 years. Uh, the interesting thing is despite the size of the market sell-off and the magnitude of the impact that it had across the board uh, in financial markets, what we saw was the fastest recovery from a bear market in history. So if you look at the chart on the upper left, what you'll see is the February to August recovery from a bear market was the shortest in history, 126 days. And this compares to less than half of the bear markets in the 60s, uh, the 66 bear market, the 61 bear market, and then the last real bear market that we've seen recently uh, in the late 80s. So about a third of that, of that bear market. So basically the world bounced back uh, relatively quickly. Um, and then as you see this year on the right-hand side, stocks are already up. 
In particular, what you're seeing is the top light gray uh, is the Russell 2000 index. And that's an index of smaller cap, high growth oriented stocks. And so what we're seeing now is the valuations of those stocks, which frankly were the hardest hit over the last year, are returning and investors are flocking, uh, flocking to those. Uh, some of the near-term drivers that have lifted the market in particular are earnings. Companies are outperforming um, what was expected. So 80% of companies beating uh, their estimates, uh, which is significantly higher than in the last five years. So companies are doing extremely well. Um, and while the economy is, is returning, it's still going to uh, take a number of years for us to get at full employment. That's expected to be until Q2 2023. So what's really, what's really driving the market in addition to earnings? Well, it's retail trading. So as you know, you know everyone's at home, everyone's looking at the market. And in some instances we call retail traders or Robinhood traders, the reality is just folks buying stocks at home because they're, they're sitting in front of their screens. And so today about 15 to 20% of all daily trading volume is what we call retail. So that's stock brokerage account trading versus institutional trading, which are folks like mutual funds like Fidelity or pension funds trading large positions. So retail has become a much bigger aspect of the overall equity markets. And then certainly the stimulus, um, which is you know, expected at some point in time here in the near future, is sort of providing a backstop to the overall market environment. So you can think for right now, the equity markets are, are extremely strong. Let's go to the next slide where you can really you can really see that. So this chart on the top is a is a chart of issuance and it's something that those of us in the in the investment banking world pay close attention to. So the top chart, if you look on the left hand side, you see January and February and those bars look rather small. Those are actually record months. So, so those reflect very strong months of issuance. You see in March the equity issuance went to a dribble, and that was really because of COVID. Uh, those were issuances in the first part of March. Basically, second half of March, nothing happened in the equity markets for about three, four weeks. And then in April, May, and June, you saw these massive spikes of capital being raised, really associated with companies bolstering their balance sheets and making sure they could weather what was perceived to be an uncertain storm going forward. And then you sort of had this flip in the market. So that cap Capital May, June was more um, capital to, to bolster. Then it became opportunistic. The markets improved and then July, August, September, we had a return of what you see on the bottom part of the chart of the dark blue, that's the IPO market. The IPO market return, which means investors are willing to pay for brand new issuance of high growth, uh, of high growth stocks. So then you see a very steady high level of pay. So it doesn't look alike, like a lot's going on, but again, if you compare it to February, of the year, those are record months every step of the way. And so net net, if you look at the bottom left hand chart, what you ended up seeing is 2020, which is the second bar from the left, being the largest year in equity issuance uh, in history. So it was bigger than the dot com craze of 99, 2000, each of those years, and bigger than the next uh, biggest market was 2013. The pace that we're running right now will further set records if this continues. So on the left-hand side, you see we're running at a, about a 571 billion pace for, for issuance. On the right-hand side of the chart, what you see is kind of the breakdown between uh, technology and uh, healthcare and consumer. CNR is where you see consumer, and that's where you would see food stocks. That represents about 3.8 billion of issuance. But again, that is also a record level of issuance for, for consumer stocks. Flipping to the next slide, this is where we really focus on, on IPOs. And again, uh, the middle, middle chart is 2000, or top chart on the left, and the third bar from the right shows, uh, from the left shows 2020. And what you see again is record issuance uh, versus recent years. And then the two charts on the right, you see what's going on this year. Again, we're off to a record year. So we are layering a record on top of another uh, record year of issuance. The middle chart, when we say pricing versus, versus initial range, this just is a, a barometer of how well deals are doing. And right now, uh, on the right-hand side, you see 41% of deals are pricing above the initial um, share prices that they are targeting as part of the transaction. So that means that the, the stocks are doing extremely well 
and are being uh, well received by the, by the overall market environment. Now let's flip to page five. So this is, so we have a really strong IPO market. Lots of companies raising capital, and then you layer this on top of it, and this is the SPAC market. So what is a SPAC? A SPAC is a blank check company that raises capital to basically allow other companies to go public. So you can think of it as an acquirer, but really it's an interim step for another company to go public. And so these companies raise somewhere between 100 and 600 billion on average, sweet spots around 200 to 300 million of capital that they raise, and then they in turn, in turn buy businesses with that capital. The companies that are going public roll into these entities, and as a result of that, become public companies themselves. These entities have around 600 billion of buying power, which if you remember what I was talking about, the annual issuance of equity securities last year was 400 billion. So these entities have 600 billion of buying power. So these are massive, massive pools of capital. This year, there have been about 144 SPACs already formed. There are over 350 SPACs looking for targets in the market right now. And there's about 50 SPACs going public a month. So think of a SPAC as an entity that is gonna search for a private company and take it public uh, via the SPAC vehicle. So in addition to the traditional IPO market, this pool of capital has become completely transforming on Wall Street. We are spending probably at least 50% of our time working, with, working for, that means raising capital for, or working with these types of entities in terms of finding partners and prospective opportunities. So why SPACs versus a traditional IPO? The advantage of a SPAC for a private company is that it allows the private company to actually put five-year projections into their disclosure, which is not something they're allowed to do in a traditional IPO. It also allows them to tell their own story and pick their own comparables. So if you can imagine a disruptive food tech company like App Harvest, who essentially last year in 2020 had no revenues, but five years from now is expected to have north of a half a billion dollars of revenues, it allows them to portray that story over a long period of time and help investors understand what their business might look like relative to some other comparables. And so they use companies like Beyond Meat or Vital Farms, which are already well established and essentially utilize the thesis of sustainability, such as pesticide free, better for you, closer to um, the consumer. Um, and uh, lower, lower greenhouse gas emissions as, as part of their story. And that got investors excited about the opportunity and allowed them to raise capital at an initial billion dollar valuation, even though they had no revenues, which is absolutely fascinating. So if you look at page six on the next slide, again, this shows you the new issuance of SPAC vehicles. And as I mentioned, this is, this is off to a record pace. So people ask us, do you expect this trend to continue? And the answer is, with the number of specs that are going public and the amount of buying power that they have, this buying power could be well into a trillion dollars in the next three or four months. The answer is they're likely to be around for, for a long period of time, given the sheer number and sheer size of capital that's in the market. So now we go to page seven. And as we look at the specialty food category, what this is a chart of publicly traded packaged food businesses, both large cap and small cap. And I'll just have you flip the next slide. Sorry about that. Did we freeze? Um, on page seven, there we go, perfect. Um, you'll see the red line at the top is the S&P 500. And then you see packaged food businesses, which unlike a couple of years past, have actually underperformed, not by a lot, but by a little bit with the S&P. And this is reflective of some of the dynamics we've talked about in the past, that a number of the large public companies are in the process of restructuring their portfolios of brands and products. A number of them have uh, run, are running or have run processes to sell off lines of business that are no longer growing and are reorienting their businesses toward 
uh, higher growth, uh, higher sustainable, plant-based, and or Okay. So what's happened with specialty food companies in the public markets is that there has been a similar amount of activity. So the reality is, is there's not a lot of specialty food IPOs. The main driver of capital markets activity tends to be specialty food companies actually selling to private equity firms or to larger strategic players. And so that tends to be most of the activity. But we did see four deals this last year. Interestingly enough, you know, we were talking about SPACs. Half of the transactions were SPAC-sponsored IPOs. And so these are companies that went public via the process I briefly highlighted of utilizing the SPAC for the vehicle. And the other two parties used uh, traditional IPOs, uh, which is, which is kind of interesting. Both of them, you can see the performance of the stocks in the aftermarket, you know, somewhere between 30 and 100%, which is indicative that all of these transactions have been well received by Wall Street. Uh, interestingly enough, sustainability and plant-based has been a theme in 75% of the transactions. Next on page nine, we talk a little bit about M&A activity. And let's, let's take a look at the upper chart. And so these are multiples for high growth companies. So these are companies that are growing, call it more than 20% top line a year, uh, and as high as 100% top line a year. And these multiples have bounced around over time. And interestingly enough, 2020, we should, it looks like there's an uptick over 2019. And the reality, the story is a little bit more nuanced than that. And reality is there's a bifurcation in the overall multiples, some of which we list on the right. And so if you actually go through the, the multiples on the chart between Nature's Bakery all the way down to say, uh, Rockstar or um, Vital Proteins, what you're going to see is two and a half to three and a half times and a few spikes of multiples like Cholula, approximately eight and a half times revenues, and um, a few others, Rockstar at 7.7, .7, and the rest tend to be in the three times range. The reality, we would say for most transactions, valuations probably aren't that different than they were in, in 2019. What we're also seeing is some of the larger companies right now have some level of hesitation in paying aggressive growth multiples for an uncertain outlook. So they're having issues with that. And so we are seeing valuations being capped. So our expectation is for the next year is that valuations really aren't gonna change that much from the standpoint of existing public companies buying private companies. But what we do expect to see, given the strength of the SPAC market, you can bet there's going to be several very interesting food transactions that happen via, via the SPAC market, particularly those in the food tech category, where, as I mentioned, you can achieve very strong valuations on the potential future, future growth of, uh, of the company. So stay tuned for, for activity in that category. I'm going to close um, the last three slides on, on ESG. Um, these are a little bit of a repeat, but the, the, um, the answer is even more relevant. So ESG was important as we talked about last year. It has become a much bigger deal uh, than it was previously. More investors, whether it be public investors or private investors are focused on ESG as a priority, as an important element to um, a company's profile going forward, uh, which, is, which is simply outstanding. On page 12, I think we know the reasons why. Um, certainly, uh, climate change the issues in Texas have you know, become front and center in, in addition to the wildfires in California. But it's all these reasons why ESG uh, is important. On page 13, um, again, what's interesting about ESG is that it does have a profound impact on valuation. So companies that focus on ESG have better returns, they have higher quality stocks, they're less likely to go bankrupt, they have fewer employee issues, and all of this is demonstrable and has been, has been proven over time. And so it's yet another reason why companies are focused on ESG. In fact, one of the, one of, one of the analysts out there has basically said, if a company focuses on ESG, it generally means it's doing the right things because it takes a lot of effort and a lot of discipline to be able to do this. 
Page 14 um, just highlights the fact that there is a lot of capital coming into the category. So somewhere between 20 and 80 trillion of assets under management going to be allocated toward ESG over time. And that starts from the largest public investors such as BlackRock and it goes all the way down to smaller private equity firms. What we're also seeing is a number of the large uh, sovereign wealth funds, both the United States and globally focusing on ESG as a, as a priority. And then lastly on pages 15 and 16, you know, I mentioned public companies are focused on this. A lot of our companies that we're looking at taking public are focused on this as well. So folks are literally creating new levels of ESG disclosure based upon SASB or TCFD or, um, uh, or uh, 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 the United Nations policies to be able to address uh, sustainability disclosure going forward. And in closing, we've seen record issuance of green bonds this year. We've seen all kinds of new social bonds, including those issued by Bank of America. We're seeing green linked equity securities for the first time with green convertible bonds. And as I mentioned, sustainability disclosure is now becoming uh, it's not just commonplace, it's a must uh, for companies and even public companies that we're working with, with private, private companies we're working with on private transactions are utilizing ESG disclosure as part of their um, processes. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Q&A. Thank you, Robert. Based on your data right now, clearly the markets have taken a notice of the natural food industry in the past year. Let's hear what our audience wants to know. Uh, I've got question number one. Surveys done last year put the food industry behind other industries in championing sustainability. What key actions are needed to change that scenario? Yeah, I'm not sure why that would be. Uh, that, that actually kind of surprises me a little bit. It may just have to do with the fact that the industry may be, be viewed to be smaller than some of the other areas that um, the survey is based. So if you just were to look at some of the, you know, if it was a, an equity survey and people survey, you know, technology companies versus food companies, the, the technology industry is just bigger. So that would be my guess of a part of it. But I think, I think the other element is, is, um, is just continuing to highlight the key attributes of, of what a company is doing, whether it be, you know, related to, to the social issues, whether it be board of directors or employee issues, whether it be um, environmental issues regarding, you know, greenhouse gases or um, uh, uh, other forms of, of green use products such as packaging, making sure that type of disclosure uh, is available. And then really just, um, you know, making sure people reinforce mission driven. But that actually does kind of surprise me given how mission driven and focused, especially companies in this area are with regard to ESG related issues. Okay. All right, question number two. We have heard today that some consumer products are growing in the pandemic. How has this affected interest in mergers and acquisitions in the industry? So the, the M&A market this last year for especially food related businesses was actually slower um, than it has been in the past. And the reason for the initial hiccup in the industry was, was twofold. Much of the activity in the specialty food business is driven by private equity funds. And because of the pandemic, they were, let's use the right word, freaked out um, with regard to their own portfolios. And so they spent the mm -hmm. first six months, three to six months of the pandemic trying to figure out what they were gonna do. There also wasn't a lot of available, availability of bank capital uh, that they used to help them invest uh, in businesses. That capital did uh, dry up for a period of time. So the activity, the technical slowdown in M&A activity really had to do with the overall COVID market. Now, the reality is a lot of specialty food companies have performed extremely well with consumers at home being able to focus more on their health and diet and, and their individual interests. And as a consequence, has been an interesting backdrop for, for companies to, to grow their businesses. So I would expect going forward, we're going to see a, healthy amount of, a healthier amount of activity, although I don't necessarily expect valuations will be higher. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again, Robert. We appreciate having you on. Now we're going to move on to a special guest, Carolyn Stark. Carolyn is Executive Director of Naturally North, a group of 60 food producing companies in the North Bay. 
She will spend about 10 minutes talking about the group's recent name change and affiliation with Naturally Network, a national nonprofit and trade association in Colorado. If you have any questions for Carolyn at the end of her presentation, please send them, or send them along and we will ask her at the end of the program. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, Norma, and congratulations on uh, your new position. It's hard to replace Brad Bollinger, but you're doing a great job, and we love working with you. Thank you. So we are pleased to be partnering with the North Bay Business Journal once again. This is the eighth time that we've worked with the North Bay Business Journal to produce this conference. And I really give your team credit at the journal for doing this in a virtual way, and all of us have experienced the technical problems that you did this morning. So, so thank you to your team for, for persevering. I want to give everybody an update and then share some exciting news. In 2020, it's already been said many times, it was a very challenging year. And we started the year with some very aggressive plans for bringing value to our members. But in March, as we all know, it changed. But I want to really make the point and I will share some slides in a moment, that what we do is really build community among our natural products and specialty foods companies here in the North Bay. So beginning in March and going all the way through June, we had weekly executive calls that were led by Blair Kellison of Traditional Medicinals and Xavier Ankovich from Amy's Kitchen. And we had as many as 65 people on these calls talking about how to communicate to employees, about how to change production lines because our essential workers were working daily to put food on the grocery shelves of our, for our consumers. And also at one point, even when acquisition of PPE was so um, hard to find that Amy's Kitchen actually helped in the acquisition of that for many of the companies out there. So I do wanna thank um, our leadership here at Naturally North Bay for the work in bringing community together and then it, it followed through all the way through the year through our marketing activities in our marketing working group about how to pivot your marketing plans and sales plans all the way through to now in 2021, where we're working very hard to do on-site vaccinations for our companies. And Amy's Kitchen and Clover Sonoma are working with us to do that with Safeway. So that is what we do and in, in, um, very pleased to be able to talk a little bit more about what we do here at Naturally North Bay. So this is an organization that in um, 2021, we have decided to join the Naturally Network, which is also an, a national organization that we've worked with Naturally Boulder to establish throughout the last 18 months. It now includes 18, eight affiliates, as you can see here, the North Bay, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego, as well as Boulder, Austin, Chicago, New York. And we are like-minded organizations that are organized to really promote the natural products industry. The benefit to our membership is going to be increased programming available to all of our members here in the North Bay that will be coming from not only our programs, but also from affiliates around the country. We can share best practices across a national platform, which is a foundational element of our membership and most importantly, we can be a part of the, natural, the national leadership voice for our industry. Our founding members of the North Bay FIG, now known as Naturally North Bay, include these very well-established and well-known companies. And I'm very pleased to thank them for their ongoing support to um, help us in this transition. But we also have annual sponsors that help us do this as well. And these are folks that be involved with us. They, they work with us to bring our programming and to lend their leadership expertise to our members. And these, this is just a sample of many of the members of our, our group here in the North Bay. And many of you can recognize the brands that you see there. I also want to thank the members of our board of directors. They, they actively share what their exper expertise is with us in keeping the North Bay FIG, now known as Naturally North Bay, um, going and working as a thriving organization. We're very proud of the fact that we have large companies as well as smaller companies and women and people of color on our board. It's a very important um, attribute for us to demonstrate as we go forward in our world. We also have a steering committee made up of people who are, all of these people are volunteers, but our steering committee also puts a programming together. 
and we have working groups in sales and marketing, in human resources, in finance and accounting, and quality assurance. And these folks are leading that um, with me to bring that to our membership. This year, we're going to be um, bringing a leadership roundtable to our CEOs of our member companies that will be quite exciting. And then also we plan to um, conclude the year with a, a big event like we always have, where we recognize the founders of our companies, the emerging brands, and also celebrate our community. So I'd like, love to invite you to find out more about Naturally North Bay and then join us. And you can look at our new website at www.naturallynorthbay.org. Thank you, Norma. Norma, you're on mute, I think. There we go. Thanks, Carolyn. We appreciate you bringing us up to date on Naturally Natural. Um, next, our next speaker is Laura Dickinson, and she is the co-founder of several groups, including Climate Collaborative, as well as co-founder and executive director of One Step Closer to an Organic Sustainable Community, or OSC Square. This group consists of founders and CEOs and CEOs of companies who have banded together to create new business models to address climate change issues. Among its efforts is the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Collaborative, or JEDI. These are experts and industry peers who have committed themselves and their organizations to bring those ideals to the natural food industry. Laura is a trailblazer in introducing discussion of sustainability and equality in the natural food industry. Today, she will fill us in on the progress made in those efforts. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Norma. Wow, it's good to be here. Um, I, I've had the, um, the privilege and, and sort of the, the learning um, opportunity to be with uh, this group last year, which was, which was pretty incredible and um, gave you all a sneak preview of the Jedi Collaborative. And little did I know or we know that when we launched um, a, a couple of months later, what seatbelts we would have to fasten to be on this journey of, of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in this particular past year. And so um, I'm going to share with you more about that and, and more broadly the perspective and the insights that have shifted for us and I think for the industry. And also in listening to these presentations over the last hour, which have been just incredible, um, it's occurred to me that the sequence of, of these presentations is quite interesting because in reflecting on a news incredible presentation, um, there's another area that I challenge I saw a little bit of um, in the chat, which is what about, you know, as natural products continue to grow and innovate, the measurement of mainstream. And, and I would take that a step beyond and say, what about those opportunities that we haven't really addressed, which is um, people, not necessarily consumers, people who have not had access to our foods and, and people who we have not um, really uh, made the foods for in the past. And so I'm going to talk about that and what I, I believe is the largest opportunity in this industry to continue to innovate and thrive. Um, and on the investment side and looking at Robert's presentation and listening to that in ESG, it's incredibly encouraging and um, perhaps also one of the biggest investment areas that I'm spending a lot of time on um, within the JEDI Collaborative is the investing in those we've never invested in before that have some of the biggest innovation um, to unlock um, in terms of foods that are, are accessible and culturally re relevant to a broader population. And um, I challenge this group of amazing leaders to start to think about their business in um, a very different way, not um, certainly to, to um, create a thriving um, community of employees and staff and supply chains, but also to really unlock growth that um, may be out there that hasn't traditionally been a focus for this industry. And so I'm going to just start um, with sharing. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to do this on my own. So let's, let's hope that it all comes through in terms of the screen and just do a quick check if you all can see that. Norma, 
Is that coming up for you all? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can, we can see it. Okay. So um, OSC is, um, as, as Norma shared, a network of CEOs. And we came together, um, oh gosh, it's been nine years now, what a journey. Um, as frankly for me, a little bit of a hobby and it's now um, far more than a full-time um, job to um, really look at how when we bring leaders together, what can we unlock um, when we really intentionally look at our own leadership, our own potential as companies to grow and our potential to work together, um, much like this group to have impact far beyond ourselves and a greater legacy. And so this is a, a snapshot of some of the folks in our um, network that are um, a, a lot of you know and a few in the North Bay um, and um, and continuing to grow and we don't really look at wow we're all about growing membership very different than that it's about intentionally coming together with folks who are very values aligned on things like ESG and and deep deep mission particularly when it comes to regenerative businesses, regenerative agriculture, addressing climate change, addressing um, zero waste, and, um, and certainly addressing the people side of our industry. So these are um, the three collaboratives we've, you know, as we've journeyed along, and I have personally, I found that while incredibly challenging, we've been able to sometimes stumble and, uh, and find our way into um, having a, quite a track record of launching industry collaboratives. The first being the packaging collaborative. Um, and then about five years ago, I co-founded the climate collaborative, which is um, the broadest in terms of the industry um, participation with over 700 companies. And then most recently, the Jedi Collaborative, which I'm gonna focus on a little bit more today because what I didn't realize um, at, all along was that when I started OSC and co-founded it um, with Ahmed Rahim of Numi T um, and our voices were you know, somehow centered, even though we were particularly and primarily amount, around some very, very visionary and, and um, supportive white male CEOs, um, that um, this was a Jedi journey for me and for us all along. And so um, I'm going to go into first the packaging collaborative, which is a, a network of companies like this. And I've shared this in the past, and some of you are involved in this um, network, which we're actually having a meeting in parallel right now. So I've been going back and forth with an amazing group of uh, at least 40 companies um, to really look at how do we move one step closer to zero waste. Um, but beyond that, what I've learned along the way and reflecting as we've gone into JEDI is that this would not have happened, this it, collaboration platform, this innovation without the perspective of the others in the room when um, we started to think about packaging eight years ago and what an Achilles heel it was because the folks who stepped up with me to co-found the packaging collaborative were the one other female and the one non-American in the room who had the perspective of seeing what trash that was not um, the trash of the people and the, and the Cambodian shores of, of the oceans there um, was doing to impact those populations. And what um, the, the trash that was piling up in the Caribbean with a Peace Corps volunteer was looking at that um, was doing to the population because they had nowhere to dispose of it. And so those two people along with me were the, were the first to really jump in and say, how do we take this on in a bigger way? And we've continued to grow this effort um, um, significantly. And so with that, then I, I realized, and we all realized, well, packaging is a huge issue, but climate change, wow, why, um, how and why do we do we um, do we not focus on this when we were looking at this five years ago as an entire industry? It was not top of mind or in our lexicon a whole lot, even though it was in the back of our minds. And so that initiative has grown. Even in COVID, we've had over 150 companies um, get involved. I mean, the big holdouts, UNFI and Whole Foods, have stepped in with us quite significantly over the last year, which has been hugely encouraging in a challenging time. 
Um, but what I um, am reflecting on this and really thinking about this over the last year, this again, collaboration would not have happened if it wasn't for two nursing moms, me being one of them with our third kid, um, being in the room with a group of scientists in the OSD um, network of CEOs, listening to a pretty gloom and doom presentation and feeling that emotional response, not just a, a business response to the potential um, challenges we were facing and the potential we could have by coming to a get there to address something way too big for any one of us. And so um, I, I really um, want to uh, challenge us to think about that from a business perspective as well. What can we unlock when we um, have very different people from ourselves and who we look like in the room? Um, but that was something that really bothered me also with climate change was we were talking about all these, I'll just go back, environmental solutions. You see all these, the nine commitments we have, and we were pretty darn good at the environment in this industry. Um, but one of the biggest um, secrets that you all know that we, um, we found and have revealed over the last three or four years is that um, elevating and empowering women and girls is uh, the biggest um, uh, solution to addressing climate change overall. And there are many reasons for that um, that a lot of you have probably heard about over the last few years. But what really sat with me is we weren't getting at it through um, climate collaborative and the environmental solutions. And so we started to ask ourselves with an OSC, how do we empower the marginalized communities of, of anyone, including women anywhere, if our own industry lacks diversity of leadership and those perspectives at the table? And how do we foster next level innovation without diversity of perspective in our industry? And so um, this bottom slide is uh, our annual OSC retreat. You might recognize some familiar faces if you look closely, which is pretty darn fun. But these are where a lot of these impact projects are born. And at this past retreat a couple of years ago, again, it was the diversity of perspective of two women, um, including Cheryl O'Loughlin and one BIPOC male, and myself, who really identified and stepped up to um, tirelessly <laughs> work on Jedi um, more than we ever imagined. Um, but that wasn't enough. And we were kidding ourselves by thinking that we had all the answers. Um, and so we launched the Jedi Collaborative first with the sneak preview to all of you and then to the industry on um, April 29th to the leadership um, of the natural products industry. And I'm going to see if this video works. For I grew up in the see. South, in South Carolina, going to Christian school for 12 years, and I didn't know a single gay person growing up. You kind of carry around this like deep dark secret and this thing that nobody can ever know about you and something that your entire culture tells you isn't okay about yourself or is like intrinsically wrong with you. When it comes to the topic of diversity and discrimination, I think these episodes and these incidences aren't always super obvious. The discrimination may have come from opportunities I didn't know that I didn't have, from conversations I wasn't invited to participate in, meetings I wasn't invited to. There are some investors who would taste what I have and they would say, well, you need to raise $100,000. Well, I've raised over $100,000 and I'm still not getting an investment. When we talk about biodiversity, we're talking about the importance of diversity of people as well. It's all part of it. JEDI stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. This project is not about getting people in trouble or outing people as much as becoming more open-minded to a variety of perspectives. We're talking about how do we restore value to historically oppressed people. We're building a movement of people who really want to see transformation in this country and in the world. It's just a fact. I mean, there are so many studies, at least 20% more revenue long-term when you have a more diverse team, more innovation revenue, better decisions are made. When I first started working in the food industry, my first month on the job coincided with the month of Ramadan, an Islamic holiday where we fast during the daytime. Literally like my second day on the job, I was supposed to go in and taste this whole range of fruit snacks. So eventually I told my R&D person, I'm like, look, can't taste this product with you guys. Like you go, go ahead, do it without me. Like I'll, I'll be fine. And she was like, no, absolutely not. After you break your fast tonight, taste the products and bring your notes tomorrow. It was such a small gesture, but it made me feel super welcome, super included. Those are the type of things that you want to bake into your work culture, right? It's not just, hey, we don't discriminate against people or we're not racist. It's like, no, we're 
proactively inclusionary. We have a data platform called Helio. We track about a million and a half different consumer brands. We have 18 companies that we've invested in on the equity side. 12 of them are led by candidates that we would qualify as diverse candidates. Half of them are led by women founders. Our goal is not to go out and look for diverse candidates. It just so happens that using data, it leads us to a diverse founder pool. In order for a business to be truly relevant to the future, it has to be included. It has to be socially responsible. It has to be diverse. There's a huge food access issue of how to get healthy, nutritious, ideally organic food into the hands of all people in this country and then in the world. If we don't change as companies, we will die as an industry. This is a moment. You see other moments in history where people didn't take advantage of a time. We are at that moment. We are on the precipice. If we don't change, we will not thrive. And we've got to recognize that now. By 2025, we will generate 2025 commitments to Jedi and the natural products industry, thereby increase the resilience of our food system. Okay, so we thought we were really smart and ready to address this issue for the industry and take it on. And then this happened about three and a half weeks after we launched to many, most of you and, and a good deal of the leadership of the industry. And um, we took a pause and the industry really stepped up. I mean, we, we had a warm response three weeks before and a good response. So it was a lot on our minds. So we were in lockdown and um, uh, so much uncertainty. And then this happened and we were bombarded by the industry with interest in what can I do? And I want to be a white ally. And we were, you know, and not even as much what we call virtue signaling as we expected, where companies were like, I'm on board. And then, um, you know, is more of a social media um, blast than truly understanding. Um, we saw a lot of integrity within this industry and wanting to support, um, uh, uh, you know, things not just from a business perspective, which was always the question before, and there is a business case for diversity, um, but, um, but from a human perspective and a recognition that I, I need to wake up to this or my employees are going to start to have issues, my consumers and beyond. Um, and so we started to um, look more deeply at our industry and ourselves. Um, and I, I may have shared some of this with you in the past. Um, and, and we, I think, recognize it when we look around the room in places like um, this community um, and the natural products industry, which was designed by white, primarily people and white men for that same group of families and consumers. Um, so our um, representation of Black and Latinx within the industry is, is quite um, light at the moment. Um, and the representation of women on boards is also improving but certainly not representative of the 70% of, of purchase decisions made um, for our industry and our products by women. Um, we ultimately, um, within JEDI, recognize that we serve the marginalized communities, um, ultimately, those BIPOC and Latinx and uh, particularly the intersectional communities of a Black woman, um, an LGBTQ Latinx uh, female, um, and, and elevating them and bringing them into the industry. But we also recognized and had to have a hard look at ourselves, as I'm sure many of you have, and that's been a hard and pretty tough journey for me personally and my co-founders in that just the JEDI team and the OSC board have the lived experience and even the right to lead Jedi um, and do companies like um, those of us all represented here have the right to um, market to a broader population. Um, I think we do by co-creating and by elevating voices in new ways and, and recognizing that the ultimate um, expression of power is to let go of some of that. And so um, we looked at our team 
um, well, we've got, um, you know, a few uh, people of color. Um, most of the co three, three of the co-founders are white, white women. And my goodness, where are the men? <laughs> we, we need some men and we're, we're growing with that too and getting some awesome supporters there. And so um, some of you have been pretty supportive of, um, and my next call is another, uh, an interview as we're going through first rounds to hire an ED to really replace myself and Cheryl Laughlin, um, executive director director um, uh, that we're, we're looking at folks only with that lived experience of, of having a marginalized identity to lead Jedi moving forward on behalf of our industry. Um, and uh, one of the other things we're doing, which is certainly just only a first step, is to bring um, and actively looking at um, uh, outside board members with lived experience to bring onto the um, OSC board um, as, as well, which is incredibly important. We've typically just been, you know, the members are the board members. And I challenge all of us to start to think about our boards differently. And I think a lot of companies already are asking those questions now. Um, but even further, OSC is starting to actively bring in and our partners are helping um, scholarships um, uh, for a new membership and, and not asking for them, thinking about even how we orient and invite um, uh, members in in different ways to be super inclusive and recognize their context and um, and and uh, before um, you know throwing them into a meeting or a place and also how can we make it easier in terms of scholarships to get involved um, and so um, with the Jedi collaborative itself I'm just going to go briefly into the vision we've had to really rethink this a lot in the last year and worked um, harder than we imagined and brought this vision to um, not just our co-founders and um, our, our own community, but to the BIPOC and Latinx community of entrepreneurs, um, which frankly were pretty hard on us and asked them to um, imagine our vision with us and to uh, provide commentary and drive it and poke holes in it. And with that, we have really shifted our vision since I shared with you last year to be about um, recognizing that food, beverages, and supplements in our, um, the natural products industry um, must be a source of nourishment and health and wellness for everyone, um, not a source of injustice and accessibility or racial disparities and health outcomes. This industry has the power to shift the calculus of health for populations that have been marginalized in terms of health for since the beginning of the United States. Um, and so our mission is to transform the culture of the natural products industry and shift that opportunity calculus for those who have not had a seat at the table in the past, um, not necessarily by our own doing, but not by seeing the waters in which we've swum in for so long. Um, and so I'm just going to go through primarily one of the three strategies to realize that uh, mission of shifting the opportunity calculus for BIPOC, Latinx, and other marginalized communities, and ultimately the opportunity calculus for ourselves and our businesses. Um, and that first one is to support restorative anti-racist actions within companies that are here today, small, mid-sized, and, and, and mid by mid-sized, I mean companies typically who haven't IPO'd um, yet in the natural products industry. And that can lead to belonging, justice, and leadership um, and inclusion for people who've been excluded who just haven't been um, available or knowledgeable about the opportunities within our industry. Um, the second, and that's where we'll focus today because I think that's where we all have the most role to play in as companies, um, but also alerting to you to something that we're working on and I'm spending a lot of time with is which is connecting and bridging capital. Um, to BIPOC entrepreneurs. Um, you'll see that we have an investment resource portal within the JEDI Collaborative and a group of investor network we're working with to look at capital bridging. Um, because when we actually elevate entrepreneurs of color and give them access to um, provide their innovation with our industry, not only does it provide them with opportunities, but provides all of us with innovation sparks um, beyond the amazing innovation that we've seen in the last few years. And finally, we're building a platform to connect um, and bring new platforms like diversity candidate pools um, to um, the natural products industry and, and particularly by amplifying those BIPOC um, nonprofits and NGOs that are already starting to work on these initiatives. 
Um, so I'm going to take you all through, and we have some amazing early adopters here, our wonderful friends at like traditional medicinals, Clover and beyond, who have be taken, started on the Jedi journey, and some are, 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 are early, some are further along. Um, but as early adopters, um, we've, we've really started to see some incredible movement of companies. And this is a look at the Jedi journey, um, which um, we are continuing to expand on and grow and create milestones and more resources and tools for. Um, but as, as uh, with almost any big initiative, the first and vital thing is to engage the leadership. Um, and start to design uh, an inf infrastructure, including a team of people that start to build on the Jedi's vision statement for the company and make commitments and then integrate and develop an action plan. And we're developing milestones and um, metrics and KPIs along the way to really um, figure out, while this is never a, uh, a big award or badge um, overall, there are, are milestones and moments because our whole life is a journey towards justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, uh, this is just a quick peek at some of the um, initiatives and that you all can get involved with. I want to particularly call out the, the um, frameworks, the tools um, that are, are available as well as the cohort groups. So the website has, uh, I mean, people ask us for um, tools and resources. They are all there. They are free and available. We'll probably add a, a, a small membership model later this year to every company in this industry. And we have invested so much into developing these with a network of, of amazing experts. So please send your teams to look at the Jedi website for amazing tools, resources, solutions, partners, and the journey um, through the process that you can all take. Um, and then these are some programs that we kicked off this past year with an, a, a strong journey. We've asked companies to come in and say, hey, um, pioneer with us, figure this out with us and take the journey. We've set it out and we're going to iterate it by working with you along the way so we can bring it to the broader industry with more of the tire kicking in place. Um, so we have 23 early adopters who are, um, are, are sharing, learning, working together on the Jedi journey. We have a women's peer mentoring circle because we know that when women are mentored and supported by other women, particularly at the director and VP level, they, their leadership improves and grows faster than when they're only supported by men. And then the CEO action circle, we have 12 CEOs and that's been, as usual, when you work with CEOs, not only do you learn a lot and they learn a lot and get inspired by each other, but I have a list of about 25 things that we can do now even more that you know everyone's fired up to do in terms of um, building platforms and collaborations on behalf of the industry. And then we've had um, some amazing programming um, and that will continue to grow over time, particularly with our partnerships with um, New Hope, um, our co my co-founder, Carlotta Matt, really engaging and making Jedi a central programming element for the natural products industry and our partnerships with the Naturally Network. Um, so I just give you a sense of the, of the commitments that can be made. Um, all of this and many, many others of these are um, totally available for you all to take a look at. Um, but in the, of course, the one we hear the most um, is how do I hire and recruit? to a broader um, candidates, how do I even find them? And that is a challenge and there are tools and resources we offer and we actively seek to continue to build that muscle on behalf of the industry with new platforms. Um, but I would also challenge you to look at this much more broadly because without inclusion um, and, and looking at a broader um, consumer group and, and population, looking at the products you innovate, looking at the supply chain and those communities and elevating them, um, the hiring process will, will, will be limited in terms of those candidates um, being truly successful and, and adding their potential value in, in your company. Um, so we've already shared, and I won't go into this too much, but um, most of us had learned that there's a tremendous business case. This isn't just the thing to do because it's the right thing to do, and it's sort of where, where um, frankly, our, our population is going with being over 50%. Um, every baby born is of a, a baby of color now. Um, so the, um, this is not just that, but there's a true business case for um, a higher revenue, more innovation revenue, and more um, lasting growth of companies with a diverse um, team. 
Um, and what emerges is, again, innovation, relevance, talent, um, uh, product accessibility and stronger relationships, particularly with your supply chain, when that perspective in the company has shifted and we become um, wiser and, and recognize our own biases in ways forward. So just a quick snapshot of the companies who've been pioneering the work um, over the last year with us. Um, the companies who've made commitments, which we look at not again as something we make a big public statement on, um, but those that are starting to uh, really put their stake in the ground to build their own internal plans. Um, and our donor partners as well, who've really stepped up from the start with us. Um, from here, I just want to give you contact information on the website and invite you to um, uh, uh, take a deeper look. And thank you. For, for having us. Thank you, Laura. It is inspiring to see the dedication you and your groups have to bringing about industry change. We have a couple questions for me from the audience. Do you think the pandemic will have a lingering effect effectively, excuse me, do you think the pandemic will have lingering effect either positively or negatively in the efforts to continue to raise sustainability and equality of foods in the food industry? That's a great question. And it was the same, same question in a different way I got last year that I didn't feel like I had a very good answer for is who's investing in this? And and how do we um, how do we pay for this and uh, and then uh, will this be something that's invested in the future? And the idealistic answer is um, maybe now this time, um, if it wasn't during the civil rights movement, um, there will be a shift in terms of our priorities and what we prioritize and invest in. Um, and, and maybe not, but I will tell you that more investors are at the table, more, um, uh, what's wonderful is BIPOC led funds, um, funds that are led by black and indigenous people are emerging all over the place. And there are more carve outs in, um, funds to invest in this work. Um, that's one piece of it, but the other that I think is more important as this is this is an opportunity for companies, maybe not in the next one or two years, which is where we've thought um, to grow, but for those iconic companies that we all admire that will be around for the next 10 or next 20 years, without investing in a diverse perspective, those companies will not, will not grow. They simply won't because that's not where the population is going. So in my mind, depending on what you were, what you're looking to achieve, um, the answer is pretty clear in terms of shifting um, perspective and priorities as companies. I couldn't agree more. Second question, what do you feel is your most effective pitch to companies when considering whether to join your efforts? Oh boy, I think that Jedi again is a, a, a big challenge um, uh, in terms of it being, it's multifaceted. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, again, there's, there's many um, uh, 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 touch points, but I, I think it, it continues to be um, oftentimes employees caring and it mattering and, and the CEOs caring and recognizing that to truly represent your employees and their community and the populations and potential populations um, and become more human, which we've all had to become over the last year, um, that, um, that, 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 that folks have started to wake up. And it frankly, it hasn't been that short term sna snapshot of the business slide that we used to show. It's been that um, my employees are asking me about this and um, uh, we're, having, we're having talks that are, you know, some of them are not as palpable as they were in July, but they're still happening. That's good. Well, thank you very much, Laura, for your time. This concludes our, our event for today. And again, we apologize for the technology um, error that we had this, earlier this morning. We think, we'd like to thank in, our major sponsor, Carl Mackey Power and Ross LLP, and also our special thanks to Naturally North Bay. Our next, our next journal, our journal is planning a special year of recognitions and conferences. 
Don't forget to sign up for our next virtual event, the annual Impact Marin. The conference is held on March 24th. Meanwhile, have a safe and productive day.